My name is Jeffrey Sidoris, and this is Process Driven. You know, I've been fascinated by photojournalism and specifically combat or conflict photojournalism since first seeing the work of Larry Burroughs when I was in high school. His photographs of Vietnam showed a side of war that I hadn't really seen before. Not just the atrocities, but also the personal stories and the human cost of conflict. A few months back, Sean Tucker and I were having a conversation about conflict photography, and he was telling me about a friend of his who had gone to Ukraine to photograph the war there after deciding that street photography wasn't giving him the photographic experience he was looking for. His name is Andre Vashek, and after looking at his pictures and reading the accompanying essay called The Forgotten War, I knew I wanted to talk to him about not only the experience itself, but also about some of the backstory and the choices he had to make that led up to it. Here's my conversation with Andre Vashek. Please listen carefully. Photographing at the time as well has has that always been uh, in there? Started here like those eight years ago or nine years ago almost. I pretty much started photographing here in London. Mm -hmm. But now that I look at those pictures back, they were yeah not even good back then. I thought that was a big shot and that my pictures were one of the best. But now that I look at them, yeah, it's not good. <laughs> was, it was a start. Was there a particular photographer whose work you looked at? that you went, oh, wow, now now this is something, so I, I've got some work to do? Or how did you recognize that your work wasn't as good as you thought it was? Uh, because at that time, I was one of those photographers who was just spending most of the time on YouTube, listening at the, you know, listening to the camera reviews and, oh, my God, I don't have a 550D. If I have a 7D Mark II, my photograph will be so much better. Ah, right. If okay. I had a 5D II, my photograph will be so much yeah, better and yeah. I can't do anything with 550D. <laughs> and I and, just and kept... did it get better when you upgraded gear? I didn't upgrade gear. I just ah, sold my camera. There and you go. Up. There you go. Oh, you gave up. <laughs> yeah, I gave up for like two years. Two wow. Years maybe. What brought you back? Uh, I don't even remember. I think... I was already living in London for a couple of years again, and I just missed it. Mm -hmm. I just bought a little Fuji X-A1, the little tiny camera. I already had interchangeable lenses, no viewfinder, nothing. And yeah, it worked pretty well. I liked it, but then I discovered street photography, mm -hmm. and that's when I got the X-Pro1. Yeah. Did you discover street street photography on your own, or how did you get from from what you were shooting to street photography? What was the connection there? Uh, well, I was just shooting like random stuff around London, long exposures of like buses passing over bridges and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed like those pictures they've been done a thousand times. Everyone's done those pictures. There's right. nothing unique about them. And then I realized it's moments and stories that. If you capture those, those are pretty much unique and they always happen just once. And that's what I just wanted to capture, just the emotions in people's faces. What, when they, for example, notice my camera, what they do. So that's what I did in the start. I just aimed my camera. But people are looking at the menu in front of the restaurant. I just aimed my camera at them and I waited. And I waited for them to notice me. And as soon as they looked up, noticed me, they made that face. I snapped a picture and walked away. So you wanted them to notice you. You weren't trying to stay sort of unobtrusive or, or, or hidden in any way. No, no. In the start, I wanted them to notice me. Mm -hmm. Now I'm trying to keep it more candid and try not to have people look in the camera. But before, I really wanted those expressions of people like noticing that someone taking a picture of them. And did you start seeing your photographs get better over time? Or was, was, there, was there any sort of instruction or workshop or classes involved? Or what were you doing to improve? I just kept shooting every mm -hmm. single day. I left mm -hmm. work five o'clock and I spent like four hours outside before I went home every day. And when I had days off, I just spent the entire days out shooting. I really lost a lot of Instagram followers back then because like I came home, I had 30 pictures, all black and white, of course, because it was street photography. It had to be black and white back then. Sure. Now I you're not you're not serious unless you're shooting black and white street, right? Exactly. Yeah, that was my <laughs> first intention. I kind of, you know, I stayed with the black and white, but now I don't do it just because it's free photography. Right. Now it's because I actually enjoy it. But yeah, and I just spammed Instagram like 30 pictures a day. Mm. 
And were there other photographers whose work you were not necessarily comparing yourself to, but looking at for either compositional hints or, or sort of st- storytelling or narrative kind of structure? To be honest, not really. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never had photo books with pictures in them. I never really like looked at works of, I don't know, Kudelka or Bresson. Everyone kept telling me those are the masters and you should get their books and you should, you know, look at what they're doing or what they did and learn from that. I just went around and I just had ideas like, all right, there's a mirror in Camden. I'm going to stand by the mirror for 15, 20 minutes, see who walks by. Mm -hmm. There's a phone booth standing right by Regent Street. I'm going to wait by that. Uh, Or I just walked. I did like finished work in Oxford Street. And I walked all the way home to Stockwell, which is like two, three hour walk. Oh, wow. And yeah, I just saw things happen along the way. And I was taking pictures of what came into my mind. Mm-hmm. We were out uh, two weeks ago on Wednesday with Sean. Mm-hmm. And he told me that to him, I'm the mirror photographer. Every time I see a mirror, I frame it. And you take have a picture to take it. Yeah, yeah. And I just noticed it today. It was raining and I was, I was squatting by a puddle by the river. I was taking pictures of people walking around that puddle. And I guess mirrors are my thing mm-hmm. now. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of what, what McCurry does in a sense is he'll, he'll find a place. He'll find a backdrop or a, or a scene and sort of stake out a spot there and, and wait for a story to emerge or wait for the action to sort of happen. And it sounds like you're doing something very similar in, in certain settings where you, you find, you know, a composition and then let something happen within that composition to to sort of inspire you or even force you to click. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's only about like half of what I do. Most uh, the second half is me just walking in a direction and noticing the people in front of me. If so, if it's someone interesting, I snap a picture. If it's an interesting composition, I snap a picture. I usually try to have interesting light, interesting composition, or interesting story. And lots of times I find myself if I don't have all three at the same time. I don't take the picture. And then mm. I walk past and like two seconds later, I was like, shit, I should have taken a picture. <laughs> I missed it. And it's this gone. happens to me yeah, on a yeah. daily basis. Do you look at what you're shooting as you go or do you stay focused on the action outside the camera and, and look when you get home? Uh, I have the playback off on my camera. So the screen is constantly off. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I take a picture. I do five, ten steps. And I do press the playback button to have a look like, if I have a shot or not. It kind of helps me like knowing if I have a good shot, at least I have something out of the day. So it keeps me going a bit more. If I press the playback button and the picture is shit, I just keep shooting for longer until I actually get a good picture. Mm-hmm. And where did street give way to the interest in combat and photojournalism? Because it, it sounds like that's been a, a pretty profound impact on not only your photographic life, but your life in general. I was interested in war photography since maybe 15, 14, when I got the books from my brothers, from Patrick Chavel, which mm-hmm. was called War Reporter, and another Czech photographer. Um, what was his name? Jan Ribach, I think. And that's where I just loved those stories. It wasn't, and it was, they weren't picture books they were storybooks mm-hmm. and Patrick Chabelle wrote it in such a good way it was so gripping and it just like first word in that book is that he got shot in the stomach and then he's just lying in the puddle of his own blood waiting for someone to rescue him and like as soon as I started reading a book I had it finished the same afternoon right and you thought that's what I want to do <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't necessarily the first thought I had <laughs> <laughs> this is the career for me yeah, that's that's all what I always wanted ever since I was a little kid, just to be shot in the stomach. Right. No, no it's just... Uh, so it was the stories. It sounds like it was the stories from a very early age that you were connecting to, and the photographs were almost an afterthought to the stories. Yeah, it kind of planted a seed that, like, I enjoy taking photographs, mm-hmm. but there's only so much story you can get in street photography. Mm-hmm. Because it's all random people. You have, you have no idea who they are, what their lives are like what their names are or anything and it just became kind of samey you know throughout the years mm-hmm. 
And I just wanted more story. So first thing I did was I just shot some protests because that's where you get more emotions. You get some backstory to what those people want, what's going on. And would you I talk did... to the people actually at the protest? Would you get a little context and backstory of why they were there or what they were trying to accomplish? I did. Uh, most of them, I mean, how to put this without making them look really bad. Uh, when I tried talking to them, the protests I went to usually were not too friendly, mm -hmm. to put it this way. It was lots of Antifa versus Nazis, that kind of stuff. Okay. And they weren't even happy with me taking pictures of them. Which it sounds like probably encouraged you to take more pictures. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, Except yeah. one moment where there was this bunch of neo-Nazis running through a university campus in Dover. And they saw me taking pictures. They ran straight towards me. One of them tried to hit my camera, punch it or something. I quickly put it away. I got hit in the throat. Oh, my gosh. And yeah, I put my camera down. I just let them pass. I had a little action cam mounted on top of my camera. Like a, like a so... GoPro or something? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I was so pissed at myself that it wasn't recording at that time because that would be a really cool shot. But then I joined them. Once they like ran past me, they went up there. They actually flanked the police that was separating the two groups and ran right into their back. And that's where the mayhem kind of started. There was like bricks flying, bottles with firecrackers in them. It was pretty nasty. There was lots of guys bleeding. And was there and was when, there fear in you at that point or was it excitement? Not fear, more a caution. Mm -hmm. I did take pictures. I did get some good shots, I think, at least two from that exchange, but then they noticed me taking pictures again. The same and group or a different group? The same group, yeah. Mm -hmm, the same group. Mm -hmm. They noticed I was following them and I was taking pictures. They didn't have anything on their faces, whereas ah. the Antifa, they naturally had covered faces, which they always tend to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they just kicked me out because otherwise I would just get them probably worse. Right. And I noticed like, yeah, this is, there is more story here. There's more emotions than street photography, but that's, that's not it. It's, it's not as interesting. And that's where I really got interested in a conflict, travel, photography, finding people with interesting stories. It started small because you don't have the budget for it. So it started small. I have a friend who's a, a graphic novelist. Mm -hmm. So I shot a story about him working on his graphic novel. I tried contacting all kinds of people around England and Scotland, like a fisherman. Uh, never got a reply. I wanted to join them on like a fishing trip. Mm -hmm. And and are you are you writing at this point when when you're interviewing your friend about the the graphic novel? Are you writing the stories that go along with them, or are you still just taking photographs at this point? Uh, I did take photographs mostly, but I did write a little post about it as well. Mm -hmm. Nothing too long, but yeah, just a few words to accompany the pictures. Same with the friend who opened her own theater company. So I shot them doing their rehearsal. And was that context, was that sort of feeding the beast, as it were? Was that more satisfying than just shooting street? It was more interesting because, first of all, the people expected me to shoot them, mm -hmm. but... I always told them, I'm not here. Don't pay attention uh, to me. Don't, don't play to the camera. Me, yeah, sure. Fly on sure. the wall. And they usually, they'd completely ignore me, I think, I hope. I mean, it seemed like they were. So I did get some natural pictures of them just preparing, trying out their costumes, rehearsing, uh, exercising before rehearsal. It was a cool shoot. Later on, I just felt like I need to do a bit more. So I signed up for the conflict photography workshop. First of all, it was mostly to find out if it's for me. Mm -hmm. Now, th this is this is the workshop where they actually encourage you not to go, right? I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. we're, we're teaching you this because we want you to be safe, but we would prefer it if you didn't pursue this. Is that correct? Pretty much. Yeah. 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 I mean, don't, get, don't get me wrong. Those were really nice guys and they really knew what they were doing. But every time we ask them about specific details of how, how to get somewhere or any kind of help with a future project, they just kind of steered the conversation. Mm -hmm. Or there was like one of them, the main, the Jason who was running the course, he was shooting war for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that was over 10 years ago now. So he's retired from that. And he said, look, I don't understand why would anyone in their right mind go into a war zone armed with just a camera. 
mm-hmm. even though I've done it myself for 10 years. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very similar to, uh, similar to Don McCullen had the same sort of realization at the end of his career. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what and were they actually true. teaching then at, at this course? Were they, were they teaching just the artistic, just the photographic portion of it? Or are you learning first aid? Are you learning emergency procedure? What is it that they're, that they're giving you to prepare you to, to jump into this? It was pretty much all of it. There was lots of uh, photography. Um, first day we had portfolio review, which pretty much all of us got absolutely destroyed. <laughs> I, w- I went there with a you know, flash drive and said, I've got pretty good pictures here, guys. You're going to be pretty amazed. At the end of it, I was like, shit, I shouldn't have brought anything. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I get it. They made valid points. Like You have to be critical towards your work. And I think I'm probably the, my work's worst critic. So that was one part of it. The second part was uh, ethics, what to shoot, when to shoot, when not to shoot, when to stay around, even when there's something happening, they're telling you to get out, that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. when not to become a propaganda machine. And big portion of the workshop was the conflict part. So how to navigate minefield, how to triage, wow. Wow. how to p- apply tourniquet to a your own blown up, blown up flag, how to carry wounded on your back, how, oh to, my gosh. how to say someone who's got pierced lungs and is bleeding into his lungs and cannot breathe and is choking on his own blood and that kind of stuff. And it was pretty much life changing. Until then, I had no idea what I would do. Mm-hmm. And now I think if anything like bad was about to happen or going to happen, I think I would have a shot of helping people, actually. Mm-hmm. And since the workshop... Everywhere I go, in my camera bag, I have a tourniquet and a field dressing. Wow. Because this is London, you know, there were like four attacks here last year. Sure. You never know. So since the workshop, I always carry something like that with me. I think everyone should. Everyone should have some kind of a first aid course and should carry something on them because you never know. You can be a witness to a car accident that's really nasty. Sure. And you should know what to do. So none of their cautions, it sounds like, landed with you it was still in your mind to pursue this oh uh when the course ended it pretty much just reinforced the idea that i wanted to do this that yes i want to put myself in harm's way and i i I need to go tell these stories yeah where was the workshop held uh in andalusia in south of spain Mm -hmm. yeah it was beautiful the mountains there are just gorgeous we were sleeping outside pretty much the whole week in the mountains during the day, it was nice, like 30, 29 degrees. It was beautiful. Uh, Celsius. I don't know how much it's Fahrenheit. And at night, it was like one or zero degrees. But yeah, we managed. It was okay. The last two nights were like a um, live scenario. So we had scenarios going on. Like at night, there was a checkpoint. There was uh, two factions, mm-hmm. the government and rebels. And for those two nights and two days, we were just there on the battlefield or in the surrounding areas, in our under our tarps, just sleeping in sleeping bags, with all of our gear, laptops, cameras, everything. And we had to uh, get close to the rebels, talk to them, befriend them, you know, so they would allow us to shoot them when something's going down. We were photographing their checkpoint, like a pitch dark night. The only source of light was just two flashlights and the other of their rifles. Mm. I actually got a good picture from that. And... We had two people in our group that spoke Spanish, so they were our translators, Mm -hmm. because the guys didn't know any word of English. And the first night was pretty calm. Second night, there was a couple of attacks, which we photographed, but we had to, of course, stay alive. And there was lots of uh, shelling. And last night, we had to edit all of our pictures, or at least what we had, Mm -hmm. before the final day started. So we are in our tarps or under our tarps in the bivvies covered with other tarps so we could have a laptop on without a screen light like you know illuminating the entire camp sure and as soon as they saw some light or heard a noise they would start shelling us wow and when you're when they're shelling you you have to scream idf in direct fire and you have to put your vest on put your helmet on put your boots on run out of the tarp hide somewhere in a ditch where you can stay relatively safe. Once it ends, you need to make sure everyone else is okay. And then you can go back to bed. Wow. And one day did that four times in a row. And the fourth time, I was like, I'm keeping my vest on. I'm keeping my helmet on. I'm keeping my boots on. 
And and we're talking uh, military gear, bulletproof vest, combat helmet. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And the shelling was just like really loud firecrackers. It wasn't real shelling, but yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. And at the fourth time, I just left everything on. Didn't fit even in my bivy bag anymore, so I was just covered with it, at like zero degrees. I was freezing the whole night, shaking, and they haven't showed us since. And 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 again, I keep coming back to this, but but this something about this experience affected you so deeply. And pointed you in this direction. This is where I need to do. This is where I need to go. This is this is the path I need to take, at least in the immediate future. Uh, to me, it just felt inspiring. Like mm-hmm. when we were the last day, they set us around in a circle. Two photographers, uh, JB and Eric. He's one's American, one's French, and they were reading us the classic photographers' quotes. You know, like if your photographs aren't clo- good enough, you're not close enough. Sure, they were Kappa. Sure, quotes from pretty much every famous photographer. And then they were talking about what the job entails and the camaraderie you had with the other photographers. We got really close in just one week with complete strangers. Mm -hmm. It just made me feel like, yeah, this is what I want to do. It was much tougher explaining it at home. My wife was kind of hoping that this was going to drive me away from what I wanted to do. Instead of having the opposite effect. Exactly. Effectively. Yeah. 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 She was trying to talk me out of the Ukraine trip pretty much ever since I started saving money for it. But yeah, that didn't even end up being that as tough as I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. But before we get to that, because I do want to talk about the Ukraine trip, how do you manage married life, home life against the idea that when you go to a place like Ukraine or when you go to, to one of these assignments, whether, you know, as you said, you never know what's going to happen there's a chance you're not going to come back. How do you have those conversations with your wife? I really hope she doesn't listen to this, which she will. Uh, every time I just tell it's all going to be okay. I'm safe. I got training. I know what to do. Uh, I'm just going to do my best to come back home. I had good insurance as well. So if anything happened to me, she would be well off. Uh, but yeah, it's it's not easy for her. Mm-hmm. Definitely. She is always trying to keep me away from it. Like last uh, two nights ago, um, I had a holiday for September planned to just getting in a car and like spending nine or ten nights in Scotland by myself in a bivy. Mm -hmm. And I got this idea because of the forest fires happening all over the world right now that I would just follow a group of firefighters somewhere in Portugal, Greece, anywhere, and just follow them for a week instead of the Scotland thing. And... Yeah, she didn't take that easily. She tried, she pretty much talked me out of it. Mm-hmm. She's not Does that it. sit easier with her than than combat, or is it is it somehow all the same? Is it is it is it somehow all dangerous? They're just different degrees of danger. For her, it's dangerous if I go, I don't know, riding a bike with headphones on. Mm-hmm. She's a person who's really scared that anything could happen to me anywhere. Mm-hmm. So anything slightly dangerous I'm planning on doing, she just tries to talk me out of it as much as she can. She's really a caring person. Mm-hmm. And how do you reconcile that? How do you, how do you put that into perspective? Of, I I know that there's I know that there's danger. I know that this person with whom I share a love and a life doesn't want me to do this, but I have to do this. How do you how do you do that? How do you reconcile that? I'm just, I know I have to do this. I want to do this. And if I didn't, I feel like I would just be wasting time mm. or just missed opportunities. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily like financial, like getting a job in photojournalism or anything like that, but it's just something I want to do. And it's not something like when I'm 70, 80, 90, I want to be sitting at home and I wish I had done that. Mm-hmm. I just know there's stories out there so many stories to tell, to tell, to see, so many things to see, to photograph, and I just want to see it all. Mm-hmm. I just want to tell all the stories. Well, let's tell a story. Let's, let's, let's talk about Ukraine, because this, is, this, 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 was, this was my introduction to you from Sean Tucker, uh, who has lovely things to say about both you and your work. And I was kind of blown away by this, by this project. So if you can break it down, how did it come about? 
and walk me through some of the prep that went into being able to pull this off. Well, when I came back from the workshop, I immediately started planning and researching. What could I do? Where could I go with my own money? Because definitely couldn't get a job and just go somewhere first mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. when, when I haven't done anything like this before. Few places came to my mind, like Sudan, Ukraine, Caracas, Venezuela, actually, because that's when stuff was picking up over there. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan, that's one country on my bucket list, pretty much in spot number one that I definitely want to visit in my life. Absolutely love that country. Not, not to digress too much, but why? What is it about that particular place? I can't really explain it. It's just the landscape, the culture, the people. I just was always kind of drawn to Afghanistan. I just can't really say why, but I really love that country. Hmm. Even though I've never been there. Yeah, there's something, yeah. There's something that's it. pulling you there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's not the conflict. I wish there was no conflict at all. I, I wish it was the same as it was in the 60s. So I could go there and properly enjoy the country. Mm -hmm. And it's just tougher than any, like than in any time to get there. But I still want to do it. Even if it's just like Wakan Corridor in Himalayas, which is relatively safe and calm, at least over there, you know, so, at least something. Just just to be there, just to experience that place for you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So you're uh, back in London. You're, you're planning trips. Yeah. And I'm budgeting. Mm-hmm. So first of all, Ukraine is the cheapest to get to. Okay. Because it's like a three hour flight, four hour flight. Plane tickets were a big thing. Secondly, the language wasn't as hard as to get used to as my first job. Same with the culture, very similar to Czech culture. Mm -hmm. So it, was, it would be more of a sidestep than a leap in terms of, of being able to sort of navigate in country. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, mostly it was the budget. I just, that's the only thing I could afford because mm -hmm. Europe has got cheap flights all over the place. And if I was to fly to, let's say, Sudan or Afghanistan, it would be just so much more expensive. Sure. And I just couldn't do it. Yeah, Because, sure. you know, we budget for two people and I have to, can't only think about myself, to put it this way. Mm -hmm. you know, there's two of us here. And yeah, that was the only thing I could afford, which sounds bad. I guess like towards the beginning, like, all right, you, but you were the cheapest one. That's why I went there. It wasn't just that. I really felt close to the story as well. Like Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia, when it was still Czechoslovakia, got invaded 50 years ago as well. Mm -hmm. So we kind of know the feeling. Sure. So there was an emotional connection to the region. Definitely. For yeah. you, personally for you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I didn't go alone. I went with a friend uh, from the workshop. Mm -hmm. He went with me. So there was two of us, so we could even split the prices for the fixer, for example. That helped a lot. Now, still... for, for people who might be listening, explain the role of a fixer. Well, a fixer is your point of contact on the spot. He's your translator. He's your contact to the people there. He knows, let's say, the press center mm -hmm. people. He knows, or she, it was a girl. Mm -hmm. She knows... All these individual groups, because in Ukraine there is multiple groups fighting, not just the army. Yeah. There's also volunteer groups, which she has contacts to. She was also our driver, so she had her own car and she was driving us around. Otherwise, we would have to rent a car and drive ourselves or find a driver as well. So, so it's the, a pretty the, big country. The fixer is, in essence, a, a member of your group. You're, you're together 24-7 while you're on the ground there. Is that is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And she also um, helps us uh, pretty much break the ice with the fighters and with the people there because she knows how things go. Mm -hmm. She knows how people talk to each other, how to behave, how to behave on the checkpoints. Yeah. Fixer is an important person to have. Had definitely. you prearranged who you would be, and I'm probably going to use the wrong term and I apologize, but who you would be embedded with once you got there? Or was that handled by or with the fixer once you got to Ukraine? Once we got there, uh, well, before we got there, we were already talking plans. Mm -hmm. uh, we were already discussing what kind of story would we want to do, which she tried to accommodate. She was really good. She was do she's been doing this 
ever since the war started pretty much wow so she's really good she had the contacts she knew what to do she worked with so many journalists herself that she knew exactly what kind of stuff we would need what kind of stuff would help us what kind of stuff would be uh graphic enough or not graphic or interesting enough for mm -hmm. photographers to capture mm -hmm. rather than just go to find a group of people that really don't do much but they have a good story to tell but there is no pictures to take so for example she would avoid that or ask us if we're okay with like, not going there and yeah we didn't really embed with anyone within those five six seven eight damn eight days we visited multiple groups it felt a bit like like being on a tour as a tourist hmm. to be honest like because every day we went somewhere different yeah for the first three four days we were following one group of volunteer fighters but then we went to the official army positions and it was like two three positions a day wow. and said, this is this position here this is this position there this you know let's go one hour through the forest to another trenches and and this is to, to, to be clear this is front line of combat yes yeah yeah wow but we were walking there only during the daytime because our fixer she herself didn't want to stay there overnight mm. which made sense because overnight there's lots of fighting happening we wouldn't be able to do it ourselves because we wouldn't be able to talk to the soldiers mm -hmm. i mean diego wanted to stay overnight constantly but the press forces wouldn't allow it either you always have to have permission for the press forces you have to have accreditation and they just don't allow it to stay on the positions overnight mm -hmm. and we were there in a really quiet period as well to be honest there was not a lot happening uh when we were in the first position once we got out of the cars put our body armor and helmets on we did hear some gunfire in the distance we did hear some shelling but it was at least over 200 meters away wow it wasn't really like we weren't really in harm's way it was calm except See, for, uh, for you that sounds fine for me 200 meters is still way too close <laughs> still way too close for me to be to to gun gunfire and conflict i mean i'm not gonna lie the adrenaline was there yeah uh first of all you don't want to seem like overly scared or twitchy around the soldiers who pretty much live in that area sure so you don't want to look embarrassing in front of them because if you do they're just not gonna take you seriously the only scary thing that happened when we were walking through the forest, there was just a little narrow path that you could only fit one boot on. So you could always, you would have to always have to do the catwalk. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't step off the path because there were mines and it was not cleared. Oh, wow. And there were, there were some mines on that path as well, so we had to step over them. That wasn't the scary part. The scary part was because you could see the mines and the guy in front of you could spot them before you point to them when he was crossing over them. And you always watch the feet of someone before you, where are they going? So, you know, he stepped over there, it's good, I can step there as mm -hmm. well. Try and step where they bit, step, okay. Exactly, but that's a bit tough when you're trying to take pictures as well, so you miss some of their steps, and then you just hope you're not going to step on anything. And, and but, were you in conversation with the soldiers while all this was taking place? Were you were you gathering, hmm, gathering's the wrong word, Were you were you hearing their side of the the equation their side of the conflict were you were you hearing stories uh, not when we were walking to the positions or through the forest we couldn't really talk at all because the enemy positions were not too far so they could hear us i see so we were talking to them when we were back on the fobs or you know this the bigger bases mm -hmm. but when walking through the forest we're usually as quiet as possible and yeah the scariest thing happened was when we were walking through that little narrow path and the soldier in front of me who was pretty much showing us the way, and he was the only soldier with a gun there with us, suddenly took his AK off his back, cocked it, aimed in front of him, crouched, and started walking really slowly, really carefully, with his other arm telling us to stop, stay down, and come slowly. I was like, shit, there's someone in front of us. Wow. Like, he doesn't know who it is. Wow. And like, where do I jump? If we're not supposed to st step off the path. Yeah, I, I can't I... go left or right, so what are my exactly. choices here? And there's five people behind me, and if one of them is running slow, I'm stuck behind him. Right. Yeah, that was a bit scary. That's when the blood started pumping. But then he noticed that the guy that was there around the corner was actually just a uh, Ukrainian patrol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he put his gun back on his bag and it was all good. And then we got to the trench. We could actually see the enemy positions as well Wow! from the little windows in the bunkers. They told us not to look through the windows for too long 
because we could just get hit by a sniper. They do that pretty often, apparently. Mm -hmm. They chose to keep our heads down constantly. We saw a lot of positions. We talked to the soldiers. One of them was really interesting. He was a teacher before the war. Uh, he was a really nice guy, quiet. And he was really frustrated by the way the whole thing is treated mm -hmm. because of the Minsk agreement, which is pretty much a ceasefire agreement. There cannot be any heavy weapons used, but that's being violated thousands of times a week. Ever, there's always open fire somewhere at night, constantly shelling, constantly shooting. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he said that the people are frustrated that they cannot advance because as soon as someone advances, they're treated as the aggressor, breaking the rules, mm -hmm. but they cannot retreat either. So they have to stay on the spot and just take the fire and return the fire and just stop it. It's strange. You can kill each other, but only with small arms fire. Yeah, but that's like uh, there is an organization. They, they are called OSCE, which mm -hmm. are monitoring the conflict constantly. And they fly drones above the area to monitor what's going on. And they keep spotting like tanks being moved to frontline positions and that wow. kind of stuff. So there is violation happening constantly. Um, we were talking about it in a restaurant with people in a nearby village. They were telling us, like, well, there's really no way of us advancing and taking that part of Ukraine back because the military, the Russian military there is just too strong. There is just too many of them, too well equipped. There is no way of us getting there. So and it just stagnates to... year after year, year after year. Exactly. But wow. when we talked to the soldiers about it or the, the volunteer fighters, they said if they had the order, they'll be on the Russian border by the end of the next day. The order from whom? From the government. To ah, just... okay take Eastern Ukraine, which, you know, I guess it was a bit of a pride thing as well. And so, yeah, we could take it right away. But people who are not in the army, they say like, there's just too, there's just no way of them taking it back. So it's a frozen conflict. Mm -hmm. How were there's... you received or welcome? How did they treat you? Some of them were pretty much stoic towards us. They just mm -hmm. didn't care. It's mm -hmm. like, eh, not a photographer. Take your pictures, get out. Did it help that you were Czech rather than... It did. It Somebody did. from, you know, a native Londoner or something? I think it did because we were talking to each other in our native languages, which we understood each other a little bit. Mm -hmm. When I was eating their food, they invited in every time we came back from the frontline position to their little base behind the position, they invited us to eat. I was drink, eating their borscht, which is really similar to our food, drinking their compote, which my grandma used to make. So, you know, we were in this regard, it felt like, you know, in my country. Mm -hmm. Did we you feel a sense of camaraderie with them? It sounds like you did. Yeah, they were really friendly guys. Mm -hmm. They were really like, they were really friendly. They were really nice to us. There were some soldiers who, not, not, not soldiers, actually. Soldiers were really nice. The people who didn't like us were the civilians sometimes. Hmm. There was this building in the frontline town, which was half destroyed because of the shelling. Some families there got killed, but people still lived in that house during the shelling, after the shelling, people, because they have nowhere to go. Right. So they just still lived there. And when we went there and asked them if you could go inside and take pictures of some of the flats and you know, the destroyed windows and that kind of stuff, they were annoyed. They were, why are you here? Why are you taking pictures? You're not going to change anything. There were guys here before you taking pictures and nothing mm -hmm. changed. So it's just another sort of exploitation of their situation. Yeah. Yeah. Because the war has been going on for four years. Mm -hmm. you know, the people are already tired of press going there, taking sure. pictures without any change. But yeah, the press can't really change anything because even the politicians can't change anything. So what's the press going to do? People have already seen these pictures. So what was what was your hope with your photographs with your being there did did you come at it from a different perspective than what you'd seen before or was there some specific outcome that you wanted or expected from this body of work um i try to put this there's still lots of people that don't know or have no idea that there's a actual ongoing war happening in europe right now for lots of people it's unthinkable that it's war in 21st century year but it's going on it that there's been about over 10,000 deaths since it started four years ago. Mm -hmm. Just in Ukraine, yeah. right? That's Just what, in Ukraine, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And lots of people still have no idea it's going on. Pe people know about Crimea, which was taking over. Mm -hmm. That's another story. But they really don't know that the war is still ongoing in there. And even lots of my friends still don't know. Like when I was telling them, I'm going to Ukraine. I was like, oh, where? Kiev? 
And so no, I'm going to Eastern Ukraine. Oh, what's going on there? It's like there's a war. What? What really? kind of war? Wow. Yeah. So I was kind of hoping that it would spread the story a little bit more. I mean, I'm not being like super optimistic. I have minimum amount of followers to spread the story to. But I was thinking of it as just like two grains of salt. Just mm-hmm. tell the story to at least a few more people I could. Actually, the story spread quite well, to be honest. Mostly thanks to Sean. Because mm-hmm. when he shared it, my website got an anomaly spike. Right. <laughs> and then the... Actually, the group of volunteers we followed for the first four days, they shared it as well on their Facebook page. That got some love. Mm -hmm. Then I got attacked by a few trolls with Russian names, so I'm guessing Russian trolls, saying that it was all propaganda and that it was all sponsored by Ukraine. I wish I was sponsored. It cost me so much money. Right. (laughs) Do you you have any sort of desire to, and and maybe you can't because it's it's very close to you, but... Almost like what you did in uh, the protests in London. D- do you have a desire to to go to the other side and get their stories as well, or is is would that be seen as as almost a violation because you're you're sort of breaking ranks or breaking sides? Oh, no, no, no. I was definitely trying to stay neutral mm-hmm. in the whole thing. I listened to their stories. I understood what they were talking about. Like. I understood why they hated Russia. But then I met on the train back to Kiev. We were in a cabin of four beds. Mm -hmm. And the people sleeping underneath us were actually from the Russian side of the conflict. So we did talk to them. And they were normal people who were just living on the Russian side, Russian-speaking Ukrainians. And yeah, I would like to go to the other side and Mm -hmm. and see what it is on the other side as well. First of all, I would, again, need to have a budget for that. Sure. I could, but probably maybe next year rather than this year. It's going to take a while. I definitely wouldn't want to just go there by myself. I would need a good fixer, which my fixer says she's got a contact over there that would be a good match. Would Diego go back with you or would you find someone else to go with you? Uh, in this regard, I would go by myself as a, like a lone photographer. Mm-hmm. Just would need to get a fixer. But with Diego, we kind of concluded that we're going to do things solo. I see. Now on. I see. Because it's tough when there's two photographers going to the same places at the same time. Mm-hmm. You just in each other's way constantly. And you, know, you took that picture already. I can't take it now because it'll be just the same picture. And you go there first. You were, you were there now. So what am I going to do there now? So with two photographers going to the same places and stuff, we kind of concluded that, yeah, it was a nice thing, like doing our first war zone together. But it could have been much more productive if we went alone. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about the body of work that you that you ended up producing? Did it live up to what you thought it would be? I thought I could do better. How so? I don't know. When I look at the pictures, uh, there are lots of pictures there are like, don't get me wrong. There's actually some pictures that I'm really proud of. But if I was to go there again, I would do it completely differently. I would pick a group and I would just stay with them the whole time. Rather than moving from position to position, you'd stay with one. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But we kind of had to do it this way because we didn't really know anyone. We had the fixer paid for the whole time. And if I was to stay with one group, I really wouldn't need her with me the whole time. Mm -hmm. And Diego had other ideas as well to go to other positions. So we kind of had to do it this way. But I actually wanted to go again in September. Would you revisit any of the groups that you were with the first time to deepen that story? Or do you feel like you got what you needed or could get? from from those particular groups yeah i would love to go to just stay with one group follow them around get closer to them because when you're with someone for a longer time you get much better pictures much better stories rather than just going somewhere being there for an hour or two and just snapping pictures from the start right the people they're not as natural as they could be yeah even though the guys you know they were pretty used to being photographed already so they didn't really pay attention to us i would imagine you're still seen as somewhat of an outsider though if you're only there for a couple hours or a single day yeah, definitely. Yeah, with yeah. One of the groups, we were with them for two or three days. Mm-hmm. Like we were with them throughout the day. Then we went back to a place we were staying. Then we just went there again to visit them the next day. And yeah, they got pretty close to us. We were talking a lot. They were, they were asking like about London and, you know, who are we? Where are we from? We were talking about them. They told us where they're from. There's actually quite a few Russians on their side as well, fighting against the Russians. Hmm. 
I've got some of those pictures as well, but they ask us not to publish those because they still got family back home in Russia, so they could get in trouble. Did you have to get releases from the soldiers that you that you were with or the people that you were with? Uh, no, you don't really need to get releases if you're doing a documentary or editorial work. Mm -hmm. I would need to get releases if it was commercial. Yeah, sure. For this, it's not really necessary because I would just spend 90% of the time just printing and signing releases yeah, from the people. Right, right. It's the same with street photography. Unless you're selling it commercially or using it for putting on posters to show like a fashion brand or not something. Right. Selling really shampoo need. or something. Exactly. Yeah. If you take a picture of a bald guy and say he didn't use the shampoo. <laughs> yeah. You don't need a model release for, you know, for street or documentary photography. So how did, tell me how your photography changed or did it change in the wake of this? Just even your street photography. Do you find yourself seeing differently after this? Not really. That's what I've recently noticed and I'm kind of afraid of that my photography kind of hit the wall and it's not really changing or going forward for the mm -hmm. past few months. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much samey. And I don't know if it's me just finding my style that I enjoy or if it's just being in a rut. Mm -hmm. and just yeah. Is it the subject matter or is it something deeper? It's the way I shoot, the composition, the way I edit the pictures, the way I put them together. The subject matter is different, like street versus Ukraine. That was completely different subject matter. Mm -hmm. There was so much more in those pictures from Ukraine than there is ever in my street photography. I feel kind of limited by my own photography. I really don't know how to do color, for example. When I try to take a color picture and edit it, I feel kind of lost. How so? Do you do, Is the color almost a distraction for you? I just feel like I either overdo it when I edit color mm -hmm. and it just looks terrible, or I just rather skip the entire process, change it to black and white, and then I know what I'm doing. There are some color pictures that I did that I am kind of proud of, but there's like one in a thousand at least. Mm -hmm. And that's just because the light was just right on point when I took that picture. But if the black and white is, if that's saying what you needed to say, I mean, these are, these are beautiful photographs, this whole series in, from the Forgotten War. They're wonderful photographs. And I don't, I mean, I, I, I guess I'd have to see them, but in looking through this body of work, there hasn't been a photograph where I went, oh, well, that would have been good had it been in color. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Uh, there are a few there that would be good in color, like where the flags were really apparent or when they were doing the medical training and there was lots of blood included. There was like blood all over the helmets and all over the bodies. And that would be much more visual. I still put them in black and white just to keep it uniform. Mm -hmm. What's the reaction been uh, beyond, you know, Sean kind of, helping spread the word about it. What was the reaction to it when you, when you came back and, and started sharing the pictures? Was there, was there an interest in the photographs or did the subject matter, do you think maybe prevent the interest in the photographs from, oh gosh, being stronger, the reaction being stronger than what it was? Cause you said so many uh, people don't even know that there's something going on in Ukraine. That was a really good reaction to the writing. I, I was actually surprised that mm -hmm. lots of people, mostly people were talking about the writing rather than the pictures. More so than the pictures. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I have no idea. I mean, I was never really trained in like writing, mm -hmm. especially because it's my second language. I'm not really that profound in English. Sure. Just people said it was just really heartfelt. I was told that it felt... Like, I really cared about the story, which I did. I mean, at the end, the especially the part about those villagers living on the front line. Right. Hiding in the cellars. That, that was the part that got me the most. That, like, when our fixer was translating those ladies, she just couldn't hold it together. She was crying the whole time that she was translating. Wow. That was really tough. But those people, they have nowhere else to go. That's their home. Regardless of what's yeah. going on there. Sure, sure. Exactly. They yeah, it's, it's so easy to say, well, how can you live there? It's a, it's a conflict. It's how, how do you, why do you stay there? Well, it, it's my home. Well, it's all I know. Yeah, and what am I supposed to do? Like, I can't sell this house. No one's going to buy it. Right, right. So where, where do I go? There's about 2 million displaced people in Ukraine. Wow. Who had to flee. And they're pretty much refugees, but they're in, refugees in their own country. Mm -hmm. They just live in sanatoriums and like, impromptu shelters. Yeah. 
There is a story of, uh, I think it was a couple that they fled to Kiev and they actually had a pretty successful life there. They, I think, opened the nightclub and they're doing pretty well. There's lots of uh, IDPs, the internally displaced people mm -hmm. that had houses outside of the war zone so they could still stay in some of their other houses. But there's still tons of people that have nowhere to go, especially Avdivka, which was the frontline village that we spend most time in. Mm -hmm. This is where I think, as, as I'm reading through it or as I read through it, that was where I wanted to see more. I wanted to, to hear more from those people in those two villages that you visited. Mm -hmm. You know, as you said, there's such an interesting almost polarity of, of you're surrounded by this, this war that's been going on for four years, and yet you, you can't and have nowhere to go. Yeah. The, the, the village was really, really strongly shelled in the last four years. Now mm. it's calmed down. Mm -hmm. There's still an occasional mortar shell falling here and there. Last year, there was a British journalist that was really badly injured in his eyes because he stayed in the village overnight. Wow. And there is the big coke plant that's pretty much holding the city standing because if the coke plant wasn't there, they, the people wouldn't stay there. That's the only thing providing jobs to those people. And if that coke plant shuts down, there's pretty much no way of restarting it. I wanted to incorporate that in my story. So we went there for about an hour. It was pretty impressive as well. Mm. But, you know, it's a it's a coke plant. You've got dozens of those around anywhere, everywhere. It's just this one was special that it was right on the front line. It was shelled as well a few times. A couple of workers died in that shelling, but it's still working. But since then, they have shelters in pretty much every department of that plant. Are you are you thinking about and this is something that I, I, I would love to, to talk to more photojournalists that, because it, I am fascinated by the subject matter and I'm, and I'm fascinated by the mindset that it takes to do the job. Is, is there a point that you're th thinking about people like, you know, Tim Hetherington or Chris Hondros or, you know, like these were guys that loved doing their job and were passionate about doing their job, but were inadvertently killed in the line of duty. Does does that creep in? Or are you so focused on being in the moment that you, you can't allow yourself to think about? I, I didn't even think about that at all. I wow. just Not that I didn't allow myself to think about it, like mm -hmm. forced myself not to think about it. I just didn't think about it. Wow. I was just there. I knew I had a job to do. And I just tried to do my best to get the story and then get out alive. But I didn't really think occurred to me at all that something could happen to me, except a few points. Well, when that guy spotted someone in the forest, right. <laughs> well, we we're driving across an overpass between two positions, but that overpass is a completely open field, wow. visible from all the positions, and they had to drive through there real fast because of sniper fire. So at that time, I was like, yes, yeah, something could happen, but the chances of something like happening to us directly right now just... Not, don't think about it. Mm -hmm. you know, there's no point in worrying about something happening to you. Because you just, if, not, if nothing happens, you worry for no reason. And if something happens, worrying is not going to change it. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. It really is. I mean, the stories that, that, that you and others have come back with, uh, you know, to to the people that do those things, it's it's worth the risk, and and I'm I'm grateful that that there are people like you and and countless other photojournalists who put themselves in harm's way to tell and share and and document these stories. But man, I just I just don't think I could do it. I don't think I could do it. I didn't really feel risk there, to be honest. It didn't feel dangerous to me mm -hmm. as much as I thought it would. Like when I was arriving. And we got to Kramatorsk, which is like the city that's on the on the start of the military zone. Mm -hmm. That's where the first checkpoint started. And that's when I was like, shit, this is real. We're here now. Yeah. It's happening. And then our fixer picked us up. We we're driving for about two hours closer to the front line. And once we got to the village, I was like, all right, we're here. Anything can happen. She told us, don't step on the grass. I mean, they cleared the city, but still, I don't wow. trust it. I don't, I don't step on the grass. Which Diego didn't care about it at all. He's like, ah, I'm going to go take pictures. And he just went on the grass. <laughs> huh. But Either brave uh, or stupid. Um, <laughs> or a little bit of both. <laughs> I, I would say the latter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Diego. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he's a nice guy, but this really pissed us both off, me and our fixer. Wow. Because we were really close to him, and if anything happened, we would get the same. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. But yeah, when I got there, the first few hours, I was like, shit, this is real. I have to concentrate and stay alive. Mm-hmm. But after, and I was like, all right, we're in the city now. And I saw the city in the videos last year being bombed. Should I put my body armor on? Should I put my helmet on? And then I see kids riding bikes across the street. And I see an old lady with a shopping bag with a stick just walking from and a shop. Does it take a few moments to, to let that register? That, that you're thinking one way, but to them life goes on and it's, it's, it's you know, it's not a, it's normal for, I mean, as, as horrible as that sounds and may be, living with this has become routine, for lack of a better word. Does it take a, a little bit to sink in? For them, it definitely became like a thing on the, just, um, they just got used to it. Yeah. There was this um, flooded quarry that the people were swimming in. You know, it was like 37, 39 degrees mm -hmm. Celsius. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like uh, 102 Fahrenheit, I think. Yeah. Yeah, people were there just on the beach, which is really nice, fine sand beach, warm water. It was really nice. And, and, if, and if you only saw that sort of slice of life, that vignette, you would have no idea of the, of the surrounding conflict, would you? Definitely. We were just there on the beach. There were uh, the big sun umbrellas, mm -hmm. people in bikini just chilling on the beach, kids swimming and jumping off an old pier. And then our fixer told us, like, on the other side of this quarry, on the other side, of, on the other bank, which is, uh, I don't know, like 400 meters away, there's actually enemy artillery positions back there. Wow. And sometimes there's fighting happening there, like even during the day. And the people here still stay swimming and they just don't care. It's, it's almost an act of defiance, isn't it? It's almost, we are going, we know you're there. We can see you, but we are not going to let you dictate how we live our lives. Yeah. Like when, then when the soldiers from the Ukrainian side run to the beach to tell people, get out of here, fighting's happening and it's about to move closer. They're like, I don't care. I get home, I get hit by a shell when I'm in the city or I get hit by a shell when I'm swimming. I might as well just swim. Wow. Wow. People just learned to live with it. They just, anything can happen at any time and they just learn not to worry about it as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course they are still scared. Sure. Like the ladies who were living in the cellar, we were in that little cellar. It was a room that was like, I don't know, two by two meters, damp, ugly, dirty, cold little room right. with no light at all because they had no electricity. So she just had a headlamp and a little candle. But if you have just as much chance of getting hit with mortar fire there as you do on the beach, I mean, to their point, we're staying on the beach. I mean, why? Why, why, why give in to it in some, you know, and, yeah, uh, on yeah. some level? Yeah, that's, that's what the party was on the last day we were there. There was this big uh, celebration. It was the Na National Day of the Steelworker. Mm -hmm. But they don't have any steelworks, so they turn it into a day of the coke worker. Ah, okay. And do they shut down yeah, the they, factory on that day or do, does everybody? No, the factory was still working, but mm -hmm. there was lots of people just in the city. There was, a, it was pretty much, a, what's it called? A fair. There were just stalls over the place with balloons mm -hmm. and cotton candy and like uh, set up stages with people dressed up as pirates and dressed up as Disney characters. And people could go there and take pictures with them. There is soldiers there guarding the whole thing. There is a military uh, kitchen there that's actually giving people the standard military like oatmeal mm -hmm. just to let them know like what people, what the soldiers are actually eating. Mm -hmm. And about 50 meters away from where this whole thing is happening, there is a road, just a forest path with two signs with the uh, skull saying mines like don't go past here wow and people just celebrate they don't care for them and, and it's like 800 meters away from the front line wow and people just, yeah we're out here to party we're out here to celebrate and you could really see that those people were actually celebrating for the first time in a long time enjoying life like normal people again they, they were trampolines for kids wow and you know when you go to a fair and you see trampolines you see 10, 11 year old kids jumping on those, nine year old kids. On these, they were 15, 16 years old because they didn't have anything like that four sure, years ago. Sure. They, they didn't have a childhood. So now they're catching up with it. Wow. 
they were just enjoying life, forgetting about the war going on, mm -hmm. even though there was pretty strong shelling the night after. So when you when you come back to to your daily life in London, mm -hmm. what do you bring with you from this experience? What what comes with you, and and how does it how does it affect, if at all, your daily life? Are you are you simply thinking about going back? Are there are there changes that that you make as a result of it? What's been the effect of it? Definitely thinking about going back. Mm -hmm. Constantly thinking about, can I afford it? How am I going to do this? Now I've seen something there. Now I can pick and choose of what to do next. And I did already write down some ideas of what to do. There was this teacher on the front line, one of the Ukrainian soldiers. And he had a really interesting story. He was uh, teaching history before the war started. Then it started and he still was teaching. But when they had actual soldiers coming from the front line to the classes to tell the kids what's going on, they were saying something completely different than what was in the books. And that kind of got him going that, yeah, I'm going to go to the front line. I'm going to fight this war. And when I go back, when the war ends, I'm going to teach the truth. So he's teaching what he experienced, not necessarily what was in the curriculum. Exactly. So now he's on the front line. And mm -hmm. once he goes back, he will teach the truth rather than what the books will tell him. Wow. And I just had these portrait ideas, which I never really even do portraits. I don't think I'm good at those. I just got like five or six portraits in the last few months. But I got this idea for a project of portraits. There was a guy that was leading the, the volunteer group and he was a painter before the war. And there was another girl that was just a gymnast before the war. When she was 17, she joined the volunteer fighters and became a sniper. And there was, they were just normal people before the war. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of stories I want to tell. If you'd like to check out some of Andre's work, including his terrific photo essay from Ukraine called The Forgotten War, head over to andrevashek.com. That's O-N-D-R-E-J-V-A-C-H-E-K.com. You can also find him on YouTube at Andre Vashek and on Instagram at androidv. That's O-N-D-R-O-I-D-V. Subscribe to Process Driven in your favorite podcast app, or you can subscribe to the new Jeffrey Sidoris Everything feed and get all of the shows and conversations that I produce in one feed. Connect with me on Instagram and Twitter at Jeffrey Sidoris. That's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S. -E -E and if you're a photographer looking to dive a little deeper into photography, check out my book, Photography by the Letter. It's got more than 170 terms defined and explained with the help of original photographs and diagrams, answers to common questions, helpful tips and exercises, and interviews with six terrific photographers. It's available as both a paperback and a downloadable ebook at photographybytheletter.com. As always, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll come back for the next one. <laughs>